Hi, welcome to Wise Beyond Bitcoin, your home for the crypto neo news, education, and opportunities. My name is Ryan. My name is Lucas. And this is another episode in our Wise Beyond Bitcoin macro outlook series, where we focus on macroeconomics, policy, monetary policy, and all the, the issues that relate to the big picture and how that will if impact crypto and financial markets. And uh, before we jump into that, I just wanted to kind of touch on some of the playlists we have on our YouTube channel. As you can see, we've done some some uh, some serious focus on on secret and on the IBC in general. We have some really good how to uh, videos on how to you know how to get Kepler and how to stake and provide liquidity. Uh, we have some videos on secret NFT opportunities. We talk about secret in general and other IBC protocols like Atom and Juno and uh, airdrop videos, all kinds of information on play to earn and just in general, um, you know, we cover the crypto space. Uh, so yeah, take a look at some of these videos. And, and without further ado, go on, Luke, what do you well, want to- I'll say that's good that you pointed out because it's relevant. You know, when times are tough and they get tough in the macro outlook there, you know, if there's a tightening and there's consolidation or corrections in bear markets, crypto blockchain, people often get attracted and find crypto during these crazy uh, frenzy bull market times where the prices are soaring. And that's, you know, historically how market psychology works when things usually have to start uh, coming back down to reality and correcting. However, if you find those projects, if you find those protocols that are actually building, they're, the, you know, being in it for the tech, so to speak, that actually have innovation and are creating something to add value to the economy at large, then when you, quote, hodl through those times and you support those, you often find that whenever the market's correct again, you are part of a protocol or a technology that is growing and has that growth potential that you see in the world of blockchain and crypto considering how that is. Right. So that being said, these are, these are just educational entertainment playlists and videos. Um, we're just sharing our research and our perspectives and our understanding. None of it is medical, financial, commercial, legal, marital, any kind of advice. It's really just, it's just that. So enjoy yourself. If you do hit the subscribe notification bell, all that good stuff. And like Ryan said, let's get into this macro outlook because you know, it does. It is all correlated and causally connected and related. There are, there right. are and right. So, so yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Well, before we do, happened? let's do a quick survey. And we can see that something happened around 2 p.m. today. If you look hmm. around 2 p.m., the major indexes started to sell off. And well, we're going to we're going to go into what happened. So there was a Fed meeting today and we were the market was poised to kind of see well what what's going to happen with interest rates what, that was the decision that was kind of on the table are we going to see a rate hike or not and we did we did not get a rate hike it's the uh, rates are going to be held near zero for the you know for this for this time for the next month or so we have another month coming another meeting coming up uh, i believe in march so we will see if what happens then but for now we'll see we're going to see the rates near zero. So you might wonder, well, why, if, if rates aren't going up, why was there the sell-off? And it was, there was, because it was, there was a bit of a mixed message. There was some mixed messages here. Um, on the one hand, we will have rates for the foreseeable, you know, next few weeks, real low near zero. But on the other hand, we got more certainty about the kind of um, tightening what the process is going to look like as accommodation is removed. And one of the, and we continued to have concerns about how high inflation inflation is above the two percent target, and the fact that the labor market, while unemployment seems to be, well, while labor market seems strong, even while there seems to be so many jobless claims and so many people quitting, uh, even with that, the labor market's strong, wages are going up, and there there is there has been some some strong hiring. So these both of these kind of point to the need for potentially raising rates and, um, and, 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 you know, in the near term and the fed reiterated that that's what's on the table. So they're going to, they've talked about the fact that this time around there could be uh, greater than just 0.25% rate hikes. So we could even see a half of a percentage point that was that's, that was mentioned. And that was one of the things that was kind of sp spooked the market a little bit. 
uh, and, and kind of led to the, to the sell-off. The other thing that was a big part of this was that we got more certainty regarding the quantitative easing purchases, the monthly asset purchases and how that's going to wind up. And the, and the, the certainty we got was they confirmed that the process of, of purchasing these assets every month with newly created money, this will end in early March. And after that, that's when we will start to, in, to see the rate hikes coming. But we, got, we did get certainty that we won't see rate hikes come until the QE monthly asset purchase um, policy winds down. And I guess that, that's kind of because you wouldn't want to send mixed signals like, right, why would, what would be the point of injecting stimulus into the economy in, in the form of newly printed money? And at, on one side, on the other side, raising interest rates is just more of a deflationary, you know, con- contracture, contracture, um, it's more of a contraction of this credit. So it's like, it'd be mixed signals. So they're going to want to wind up the, the asset purchase program in March. Then we will expect to see the first rate hikes. So kind of more, more certainty about that. And um, the final element that was a, um, a big deal is that there was clear, they were very clear that there was going to be a concerted effort to reduce the balance sheet. Now, how is they're going to be actively shrinking the, the, the uh, Fed's balance sheet? Now, it's uncertain how quickly and how much and what that's going to look like. And, and they did say they want to be nimble in, in making those decisions. So it'll be future meetings and future committees that determine what that process will look like. But they are committed to letting uh, some of their maturing assets roll off without being reinvested. So this would be you know, a treasury or another bond maturing and then not reinvesting the principal, but just letting that roll off. And then also there, there's going to be a bias towards um, primarily having treasury securities as the Fed's holdings and moving away from the mortgage-backed securities that they accumulated in the wake of the, the housing bubble in 2008. So this is a sign of, this is kind of the big the big factor, I would say, if you're gonna if you're gonna weigh the interest rate hikes with the rest of it, I would say that this reduction, this plan to reduce the balance sheet, should probably have more of an impact on um, markets than than anything else. And you can see clearly that there was a normal a, a balance sheet normalization attempt around 16 and 17, and then even a concerted effort to reduce the balance sheet, and this ran into limits, political limits, because of the fact that it was causing pain in the stock market, pain in financial assets were, were, were taking a hit. And so, it, and then right after that, the pandemic occurred. So we got back into a massive stimulating uh, policy approach. So we've got, we went from around 3.8 trillion uh, assets on the Fed's balance sheet all the way up to almost 9 trillion. So that's more than doubling. So there's a lot to unwind uh, and they clearly are committed to to doing that. So, I think that's kind of what's going on with, when you look at the sell off. That, that's that was the big, the big stinker. <laughs> and uh, any thoughts? Other than uh, we, like we were kind of talking about this before the video, but it's 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 lukewarm news, right? The fact that they're not raising rates right now. It's not a it's not a bullish response to the market like, oh, great. The party keeps going. Um, right. It, it's more it, kicking the can down the road to it, a future meeting. And and there's a lot of everyone is kind of aware that this the party's already over. They're even mentioning, look, we've got a few weeks, maybe one month. We'll have right. We'll have another meeting and then we've got to really start doing this. And it's not just interest rates. It's the balance sheet and how we're coming in to prop up certain areas of the economy. We're not right. doing it anymore. OK, well, what's going to happen when they're not doing that anymore and the rates go up? How is this going to affect labor markets how is this going to affect the supply chain and yeah. on top of that you look at the old news about the shortages and the issues with the supply chain due to the pandemic restrictions and limitations and bottlenecks whether right. it, you know there's it feels like we have this looking at a train going down the tracks with a hole in it we've got this perfect storm of of, of a recipe that at some point, you have to go through withdrawals to clean up, and right. there's going to be a, a process, some a, normalization process, right? And, and you can see, felt. 
not this, just the news. It's not just right. going to be in the news. It's going to be felt when you go into stores, when you're waiting in line, when you look at prices. When so, absolutely. Yep, that, that's that's right. And, and I, the question is, what is how does this affect blockchain and crypto? And how yes. big is this? Because many people like to think, oh, okay, well, a strengthening dollar is is a weakening dollar is good for crypto and a strengthening dollar. But there are other black swans and there are other scenarios where um, crypto blockchain is a technology. It's still an emerging asset class. It's great. It's like cars and air. It's not going to go around because of the way it's built. It's going to be around for quite some time. That's right. It. But it's still it's still subject to the um, to, to the pressures of the world economy at large. That's no doubt. Yeah. And you know, I, I think we were both mentioning the fact that there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of uh, last couple of Fed meetings about raising rates, inflation being a problem. And, you know, there's been so much talk that that expectations have, have now moved away from, you know, three or less rate hikes next year to where it's not now the dominant expectation is four, right? So the this, all this talk and job owning about rate hikes is really shaping expectations, but we haven't even seen the change in policy. It's just been discussed. And so a lot of that is, well, a lot of people would wonder, well, what's the, what's the holdup? Why not just get to it, right? And I think this paragraph kind of gets to that, at least indirectly touches on why that might be. And it's very, it kind of, it's the, you have to take Powell at his word and, 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 uh, well, you almost have to take him uh, uh, again. What's the word? The opposite of his word, and assume he's just being like he's bluffing, essentially. But he he claims that policymakers feel they have quite a bit of room to raise interest rates without threatening progress on jobs or slowing an economic recovery. And th I think that's really the exact opposite: is that there is probably very little room to raise interest rates without threatening progress on jobs or slowing the recovery. And and another third metric to consider is how high they can raise interest rates without running into deficit spending problems because of how much debt the treasury has outstanding at certain interest rate levels, the uh, debt service becomes greater than the entire, um, what the treasury can afford to, to pay out of just out of revenue. So you start having to create more money to, to pay the debt, the debt service. And so then you run, you run into deficit spending, which is inflationary, which is the very problem we're trying to get away from with raising interest rates. So, there's a degree to which there's like a, a limit on what the Fed can do. And the criticism has been that they've waited too long to start given these limits and that the problem now might be greater than this, than the supply of the Fed's ammo to be, to use a euphemism. But if, uh, and I believe that's probably right. And so that would make sense then to why you would want to talk up the policy hike. So for so many months leading up to it, to kind of squeeze out the last bit of effectiveness out of just your words before we start committing actual um, policy tools in terms of like raising rates or constricting the supply of money and this because of the, the, the very limited nature of how much that can be done. So I, I just kind of feel like that's ironic that, that he would say he's got quite a bit of room when the astute observer would probably come to the very opposite conclusion. Well, he told us, he said, He's, he's got quite a bit of room. He's got a few weeks because starting in March, they're going up. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, so we kind of got the, we got a pretty good read on that. Um, Fed's raising rates next in March. Um, there's going to be some balance sheet sell-off happening later on in the, in the year. But, to what degree, but, we don't know. We talked about also, and I, is it in this article, the next one? Yeah, I was going to shift gears to that on next article. Go ahead. Okay. Well, the question is, is, you know, a lot of people are looking to what's, you know, Jerome Powell, what's he going to do or what's the Fed? There's only so much that can be done. I mean, at the end of the day, he's just he's a man who came into a job, who inherited this huge debt, this huge burden, this huge responsibility. responsibility. Yeah, really, that it's it's an impossible job. It's like, here, we've got this ship, the rudder's broken. There's, you know, there's, you know, there's an iceberg right over there. The storm, you know, there's nothing you can do about it, but we need you to keep everybody calm because yeah. we're not going to hit it quite yet. And, it, and, and like you said, it, it's almost like whoever gets the job, it becomes this game of hot potato where who gets to figure out ways of kicking the can along until there's a blow up in, in somebody yeah. else's. But he didn't, it's not like Jerome Powell 
is responsible no. right. for the state of the, you know, no. of the deficit of the economy or what have it. It's like, at the end of the day, they're all doing the best they can with the job that they have. Yeah. And, and the and- question that this article brings up is kind of what's the, what, what's the sense in having somebody have this job? Because it's, it looks like an impossible task. And one that when you fail, failure is not just uh, an academic uh, you know, exercise. It has real world implications for people's livelihood and their, and their futures. So it's important that we, you know, we get this right. And then the, so the question is, well, how do we get it right? And then the, the other question is, can we get it right, given the tools we have at our disposal? And I think this article gets into kind of the reasons why you would doubt that, that, that it's possible to get it right. And let's, let's talk about it some. So this is an article on Barron's. We'll link it. It's uh, by J.W. Mason, an economist at John Jay College, uh, City, of Univ- City University of New York, and also a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. He goes through, discusses uh, the various uh, Fed chairmen that have come before the current one and talks about how they all had to deal with tightening policy and reining in inflation and trying to hold, you know, hold back inflation to allow for a recovery and trying to balance these competing tasks, right? And then he gets and he uh, and he mentions how we you know we we've, we've, we've kind of lionized these people like Alan Greenspan was known as the maestro, and he you know he 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 was even uh, described as like part of the committee to save the world during a certain point in time I think during the dot com bubble, and so there's been various you know um, throughout the years you know declarations of how how important and capable and wise these these technocrats are at the Fed and it's been. They've been let and held up to be, you know, by example, by Christina Romer here is uh, being responsible for, for the last 25 years of growth in the economy, which is a stretch, right? And so the question that this article brings up is, is well, if, if there was a housing bubble and the financial crisis was, um, was, was such a big deal, and if now the, the attempts to deal with that are leading to slow growth and high unemployment or, or inflation and and uh, all these issues, then perhaps the evidence didn't really work, or the medicine didn't really work. Maybe that maybe this wasn't such a good idea, right? Trading, trading all the all the stability that we achieved in the last, you know, since the since the housing bubble, you know, for we we kind of brought forward a lot of v- uh, value and spending we, that we enjoyed in the last ten years that maybe wouldn't have been the case without the policy response. But now we're paying the price. And so the question is, is, is the price worth it? And I think one of the deals that complicates this article gets into it very well. One of the problems that complicates these issues with, with the Fed and with any, and anybody who's in this role is that there's a long lags between monetary policy going into effect, or I'm sorry, monetary policy being implemented and then the effect, right? There, there, it can be up anywhere from 18, 24 months plus when you, when you will see actual peak impact of a policy change. And so that's a massive lag, right? So you're making decisions today that won't have, that won't have an impact for 24 months, potentially. And then you have to understand, have a read on what the conditions are going to be in two years so that the policy you're putting in place gels well with this, with the context of, that it's going to be um, going in operation. So, you, you, you know, it has to make, it has to be a coherent plan. So you have to have some understanding of what two years is going to look like from now. And that's a very, very difficult question. And so it's not actually, only, actually, it's almost it's impossible. Actually, it's actually, it actually <laughs> is impossible. That would be like, okay, we've got this new game where the court, you throw the ball and the person who has to catch it isn't even on the field. And they have right. to come out blindfolded and, later after you throw it. And, and you better throw it in a spot where they're going to be. Where they're going to run and know to yeah. catch And the idea is that it's, you know, when things go right, to credit certain people who just happen to be in a in position power. of, Right. power or when things go wrong to blame someone who just comes in is really um simplifying it's, it's oversimplifying a very complicated situation right absolutely oversimplifying it for sure and there's and, more this article is really good it gets into talking about how business investment isn't necessarily influenced by short-term changes of interest rates so that the monetary policy might not be as important to business investment. And if that's the case, then what's the link between monetary policy and investment or demand or inflation? And so these questions leave a bit of a black box open where we don't quite understand what the monetary policy transmission looks like. And, and these issues are un, 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 uh, unsolved. They remain. So 
till today. So there's these so giant that, questions. Please, so what what let's is break the that down in English. Yeah, yeah. Let's, okay, let's break talk that about down it. in English. Let's just break it down. That means that that what what that means is that a, a Fed Reserve chairman does not know when they when they implement a policy the transmission it's it's unknown a black box that means we actually don't know if i press on this pedal if it's going to hit the brakes or if it's mm-hmm. going to make the car go forward what they're saying is is that we literally when we make an action and say this is why we're doing it we're just placing value on why we do things and why things actually end up happening later on we have no clue because we have not yet been able to establish a connection a transmission between what we do what and what we happens do and what actually happens yet and that's kind of important when you're in charge of 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 making these decisions right you should have some understanding of of the effectiveness of your actions but they're honest about it and saying look <laughs> yes and i think what what is that so what if you take all that to consideration and i think i think reality demonstrates this to be true right cuz we're looking at a period where inflation's out of control uh, st- uh we we're worried the big fear is that inflation's going to drive consumer spending down and we're going to have a stagflation phase potentially right so clearly something has gone wrong with the direction of the economy and then if you and if you even go back to 2008 we had a massive housing bubble that destroyed a bunch of wealth and then about you know what what uh, ten years before that you had the dot com bubble that destroyed a bunch of wealth, and then before that you had the stag seventies stagflation period. Okay. So we have a lot of failure, is what I'm Let's getting at. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. In every example you just that's traditional market. Let's compare that to a cryptocurrency blockchain style of of monetary alternative. Right. In those systems, you have central authority, central powers that are able to create massive amounts of liquidity in the short run and inject it into certain areas of the economy where they need where they see fit in order to keep labor going in mm-hmm. order to keep the economy moving whether it's in the housing industry we'll subsidize loans, student we'll loans. keep that going student loans right. whatever it is we got a war we so, got to fight <laughs> right so these these when we see these bubbles popping it is actually baked in it's part of the how the money creation takes place and part of the money creation so when someone looks at bitcoin or some other blockchain crypto that has a standard set inflation rate that's open and transparent that everyone can see that that is a that mechanism does not allow for the same the type of bubbles that people are used to seeing so in other words bubbles that we see now are partly do or are very much influenced and caused by the ability to create money and choose not just create money but we're talking about where changing the it. assets on the balance sheet talking about where we put certain monies and where we put it in the industry so right to, when you decentralize the money making power and you decentralize the choices that people have so you know that's why when i talk about blockchain or crypto or when we talk about it i never talk about it from a maximalist position i think that a healthy uh to a healthy growth in the future and how this technology can be used to help jerome powell or whoever else is in position because we're all just men and women born into the world with these right. institutions and systems how they work and if we get new tools that hey look we got cars you guys let's let's hop in the car and get out of that uh, horse and carriage and, and we'll get right. you to Cal- we'll get you there quicker um the idea well, yeah, we should that- go with it right take when we see innovation we see a, a way to do it better we should we should go with it and not be and how, and not how shut it down in blockchain in order to make the make it easier make these changes the easier and and sure enjoyable and not painful for right. everyone in the process, you know, because there's a way. Well, there's one point before we wrap this up and in the video, there's one little section here I think we should touch on because it shows kind of the difference between our perspective and even somebody like this uh, Mr. Mason, who we do see a lot to uh, to agree on, right? But even with that mm-hmm. said, there's a lot, there's still things to disagree on. And the this is kind of getting into it. So he, he makes it very clear that there is no um, maestro at the helm of the central bank, right? And he and they, that there's no secret that they have of maintaining full employment or price stability or balancing these these issues, uh, and specifically 
highlighting that it's more complicated than just a single interest rate. And his solution seems to be turning it over, turning these issues over to to the elected government, to the legislature. And I'm not I'm not going to get too deep into it, but he he would he would marry uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy together, such that government spending, which would be financed by monetary policy, but the spending, the legislatures and the legislature and in the and would spend money in and maximize social social objectives, whether it be full employment or price stability, through how they spent their money and what part of the economy they would send it. Right. So it'd be very much a micromanaged sort of thing where instead of just indirectly influencing the economy through the interest rates or through injecting liquidity, there would be a, a much more concerted effort to maximize certain social objectives through political decision making. A through, new deal. Through, Basically like like kind of like a new deal. World. Right. And we both recoil against that because we believe in, uh, that no technocrat, individual or otherwise, can can know better than the people themselves what what where how how things should be organized, how resources should be distributed, and what sorts of activity should be funded and not. So it's it's sort of a non-starter to say we should just turn to socialism and central planning to decide because central banking doesn't seem to work, right? That that's not a good answer. The right. I, I would say the solution would be let's just give up control of the economy altogether. Let's make let's, it decentralized. Let's just decentralize it. Yeah. Right. Instead of having a national a national currency right. and, and, and having all these critical social objectives that we target through national policy. Right. Let's stop the top down thinking and just think bottom up. Let's let well, people plan their own lives. It's funny because it's like, let's take that logic you just applied in your article. Let's take that same logic you applied to Jerome Powell yeah. or who else would come into position and say, could we ever expect a maestro to be in charge? And I would say, can you ever expect a maestro to be in charge of, of full employment and maximizing, you know, the right. Or how about 535 maestros? Cause I think that's the number of congressmen. Oh, right? okay. No, so sorry, you, what we're doing is we're, right. we've made, we've made a very cr clear criticism of, of the central bankers ability to plan the economy. But somehow we didn't carry that over and apply it to the other people in the legislature. That they got they escaped that problem, right? Right. And it's because they have more variables they're looking at, not just a single interest rate, but which makes it even more complicated. <laughs> so we're not getting ourselves any closer to solving the problem. And I think we will both agree that the solution is just to give up trying to control things as complicated as economies top down. And just if anything just ensure people don't mistreat each other and right. create some baseline standards that people have to, to um, meet in order to, and you know, that, that we could all agree on and enforce those. But in, certain, in terms of trying to like influence the entire uh, economy and, and control it, I feel like that's a misguided endeavor. I mean, that's the whole point. That's why people go to work. Our brothers yeah. and sisters go to work in these different uh, companies to help protect us or protect themselves and their families. And, sure. yeah, you know, so how do we get there? Well, we get there. We don't get there through politics. I don't believe it's probably going to have to come through innovation, technology and disruption, creative destruction. Right. The, the only thing that's ever really changed institutions and politics is is new, better ideas, new ideas, new ways of doing things. Right. So finding out who's doing the innovating and participate and get on, get on board and see if you can um be part of the be part of the change right that's that's the way but it's not going to be through uh trying to concert you know concerted effort to change things i don't believe and if you're working in one of those places like you were mentioning earlier we're here to protect each other then you know th there are there are big connects there are scams on youtube there are clear there are clear um scams and bad projects out yeah. there and we should be out there helping each other so that the technology is able to flourish in a harmonious way that benefits mm -hmm. because blockchain decentralized ledgers this is this is something decentralized security of the data storage and privacy which we talk about with secret network these are things that can be used to increase efficiency and make the world a better place in many ways but yeah. there are there are people and there are, are ways out there 
taking advantage of this new technology. And that's that's where we could use some of the oversight and support in these industries and and protecting people from that. Yeah, 100 percent. There is a role to play. Well, I enjoyed it. I think we uh, we covered that pretty well, pretty thoroughly. We will be oh, coming so back. Do we okay. have a? Do we have something to say as far as what is this going to do to prices? Okay, yeah. Do we want to look forward? Blockchain and crypto, and looking forward, yeah. do we want to have some? Um, well, kind of- we're not we're not um, financial advisors, so we're not going to be able to okay. do that, play that role. But we, we never give some prices. <laughs> give some vague ideas about what we think might happen. <laughs> I personally feel like, to the extent we do see, um, you know, the three or four rate hikes that are kind of expected this year that that will you know put a little put a, a damper on on the broader crypto space in general like you know i don't know if we're going to see bitcoin back to seventy thousand, you know in the next six months but that doesn't mean that there won't be value plays within the crypto space right so i mean uh, the ibc is popping right now and secret and juno and adam and, and even phantom is doing real well so there, there's plays and of course, the play to earn metaverse, you know, that's that's doing its thing as well. So I think there are bright spots in crypto, even in 2022. But in terms of just broadly buying, you know, the top 10 and just forgetting about it and thinking you're going to have you're going to be up in six months or, or in three months or whatever, that might not work out. There could be some we might see some choppy sideways action. We might see uh, lower prices on on, on some of the main, you know, on across the board, we could see lower prices across the board, you know, but I still feel that there are opportunities and really good opportunities still in crypto. I agree. I think there will definitely, there's a lot of things happening right now. Like you mentioned, the um, IBC network, we love secret privacy. There's phantom EVM opportunities, hex and, and mm-hmm. pulse chain with what Richard Hart's accomplished and, and what they've got going possibly the largest airdrop in at the area or in crypto history. Um, and you have what these new applications are being built that have never existed before. Like we love talking about the privacy layer of secret and you have alter private mail and yep. some of these new NFTs that have features that Quentin Tarantino chose to yeah. launch for certain reasons. So we're finding innovation, we're finding development and regardless, that's why I say, regardless of the price in the short run, if you're in projects that are going to be around in one year or two years or three years, then when the times, when that investment, when that liquidity, when the, when the money comes back to flow, where, what industries are, are they going to flow? Where is it going to flow to? And you find like, you find like cars or airplanes or, or internet or telephones, whatever that innovation was at that time, the investment to help, to help spurn that growth and to be a part of it, that's where you see a lot of the majority of the interest and the investment flow to. And the market caps are still low and they're still highly leveraged. So I definitely feel that there, are, there, there could be some, I can see some, some pain some worldwide pain where it takes a, a little bit of time to um, correct and work some things out. But this, that's when you find the projects that are the, that are worth their the sound self. ones. Yeah. The sound the is sound projects. Something. And as they say, you know, if you're, if you want to ride it all the way in and just, and just jump in full to, to, because you're ready to put the time or if you just want a dollar cost average if that's your strategy or whatever it is because this isn't financial advice but these are it's still early it's yeah. absolutely early in a lot of projects and if you do take the time to your research and participate and get involved there are a lot of rewards there there's a lot to benefit from for sure airdrops and other opportunities mm-hmm. learning Indeed. from communities that you participate because at the end of the day it's not just prices you're you're actually supporting technologies that are unlocking new innovative ways of communicating and yeah. interacting and, and potentially everything. solving some pressing social problems too or, or showing a showing a direction towards how a future solution might look right so Absolutely. you're right it's not just money and prices there's there's a lot of social utility happening as well on these chains well, I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you um, want to make any comments, feel free, like, subscribe, uh, anything we uh, missed or you 
didn't agree with, by all means, let us know. We are not going to get everything right. And, uh, but we are going to try to come back with the micro uplo- outlook update every week and kind of keep the, the macro picture up front and center as 2022 shapes up to be a macro rich year, I would say, right. With, with policy changes and these are, these issues will be looming. I don't think we're done talking about this stuff. We're going to get and, more into it. We're going to spend yep. more time getting into the details. This is a new new playlist for us. We really love talking about it. It's been a while. We're, we're knocking the dust off of these subjects. But you talk about exciting times. If you're new to economic or economic theory or how monetary policy and markets have worked in the last few years, okay, you talk about the Fed directly purchasing assets on their balance sheet. We're talking about innovative times where they're doing things that have never been done before. When you're yeah. buying your economic books in college, they weren't talking didn't, about this. QE was not a, pass, a part in there, no. Uh-uh. <laughs> that was not so, in the index. Uh, yeah, so we are. Like you said, this year, what's happened already and what seems to be happening is what, what, what can be pulled out of the hat and what's right around the corner. Who knows? But at the same time, we've got this alternative technology that is able to sidestep, displace, help alleviate the burden, really. And I can see how digital assets are already and can be used to um, help save, not to keep the system going, but to help save it from this epic, you know, blow up, collapse issue. Because now you've got another industry, another market, where you're able to implement new types of monetary policy, I mean, sure. you've already seen China with CBDCs and what can be done where you just give everyone, say, open up your wallet, put your thumbprint, sign in right here. Mm. Everyone automatically has a credit and it's we accept it at all stores. There you go. Go have fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The implications for what? There, there's there's an airdrop. Are huge. Yeah, yep. for sure. There's so much there's so much happening right now in the world of finance and money that is historical and we'll be looking back at these issues i'm sure in the next few decades uh to come and and remarking about how we live through such interesting times and uh yeah so we're going to hopefully catalog it with you follow it and comment on it and stick with us because we are just getting started the next time have a beautiful day namaste y'all thank you